Welcome, everyone. This is the official start of the Coaching at Flourish podcast. I am your host, John. Today, I have Ellen with me. Welcome, Ellen, to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Me too. And so you are, you went through our 1.0 wellness, and you are a mindful coach, work with, uh, and also, uh, yeah, please tell us what, what's your, uh, yeah, what do you have going on in, in the coaching world? Yeah, absolutely. So I call myself a self-care coach, uh, but really it's about self-compassion. That underpins everything I do. I work with my clients who want to improve their relationship to themselves. They've got some negative self-talk going on. The inner critic is really strong, really in the driver's seat. They want to tap into their intuition. They want to tap into their body's wisdom. So we practice mindfulness together. We practice embodiment coaching. And I bring in the wellness coach program as well and use some of the tools that I learned from Coach Trini to you. Right, right. So wellness, body image, or body wisdom. What is the, what, what, what patterns do you see when people tap into their body wisdom? Oh my gosh, it is so powerful. And I practice embodiment myself. So really working with meditation and mindfulness, dropping into the body, focusing on the breath, becoming aware of the sensations in the body. And in a coaching session, I'll guide people to really pay attention to tension, pain, and what the tension or pain might represent in their life. Well, I'm on these like visualizations, and often what I find that people are longing for is represented in the body in some way as stiffness, as a block, but once they can bring language to that and sort of personify it, they can actually have a dialogue with that part of themselves, figure out what it needs, and then figure out how to bring what it needs to that part on their own. So that's really what self-compassion is all about. Nice. What's, how does this play into, like, let's say someone's life. Like what, what would prompt someone to say, you know what, I need to talk to a mindfulness coach and talk about the tension in my neck. And how does that matter in like, let's say the outside coaching session world? Yeah. I mean, I think it's really profound. And I've had clients who come to see me just because they have an inkling that they're meant to do more in their life. Like maybe it's more career focused at first and they have a suspicion that there's an intuition that they're not tapping into, maybe the body doesn't even come into it. And then I have other clients who are very well aware that they have body dysmorphia, they might have disordered eating, they might have been working with a therapist for a long time, and I always encourage that they are working with the therapist. And I think that the coaching can kind of come in parallel to help them really drill down, like, what is that conversation with yourself? We all need a container and a space to kind of put that internal world in the external and have a coach witness that process. So cool. That's so cool. I've seen it in your story. So where'd you go up and how has it impacted you today? Yeah, I grew up in rural Kentucky. So I grew up on the bourbon trail uh, and it definitely impacted me. I mean, I grew up in a pretty like small town kind of place, but I was lucky enough to have a family that traveled and I had the support of my family to kind of leave Kentucky. I couldn't wait to leave, you know, I was that small girl, like big fish, small pond, like ready for the big city. So I ended up moving to New York city. I studied international affairs and I got to live all over the world. And I launched my career in international women's rights which was so incredible and so fulfilling. Uh, but eventually I noticed I was working with these incredible women leaders, like so strong, so amazing, business leaders, politicians, nonprofit leaders, and they were burning out. They were not allowed, they weren't giving themselves permission to focus on self-care. And that was all I wanted to share with them, even though I was there to really help build their leadership and build their like business acumen, all I really wanted to do was focus on self-care. So I was like, all right, I need to listen to this. And that's when I decided to become a self-care coach. Wow. So when do they, when, what, when does someone say, you know what, self-care is it? Like that's what needs, because I, I imagine there's so much pressure to continually be more productive, bring more, do more. What, 
what like what do we need to do? Like, what's the point in time you say, yeah, self care is it? I think a lot of people come up against a breaking point, unfortunately. Hopefully we can catch it on the horizon before we get there. Hopefully we don't have to burn out or have some horrible health issue go awry in order to recognize that self-care is important. But for me and for a lot of the people I work with, mostly women, that is the case. It's like something has come up in their health, in their personal life, they're not sleeping, you know, and they just sort of wake up out of it and they realize, I have to make a change. This could actually be life or death. Yeah, that would be it. That would be the point of, oh no. How does exercise or like, how does exercise play into the soup in what you see? Yeah, exercise is so important. I love the focus on exercise and the wellness coach curriculum and I'm not like a fitness coach at all I really more play with like what are the conversations coming up in your mind as you're trying a new exercise routine or as you're trying to build it into your rituals for your day like what is the relationship to the exercise more than like the actual these are the steps you have to take because the co the client is the expert so really using their intuition to create a routine that works for them and paying attention to those subtle sensations in the body, those subtle like self-talk conversations going on to catch it in its tracks when the inner critic pops up and says like, who do you think you are to be working out? Or like, oh, you can't try that exercise. It's gonna be too challenging. Or you have to push, push, push. You can't incorporate any sort of restorative practice because you're a machine and all that matters is your output. That's a really common narrative thanks to internalized capitalism. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, um, I, I think there's a, a dis, I mean, what I see happening in the world, a lot, of, a lot of this is there's a disconnect between the mental, emotional self and then the physical self, uh, especially when it comes to, like you look at kids and I mean, they run like a three-year-old, like their primary mode of transportation is little pitter patter feet, you know, from place to place. And adults don't do that. Yeah. But it's very rare for an adult to push themselves 100% physically. Um, mm. What? How does mindfulness play? Like, how do How do you see body? Because I'm I'm fascinated with this idea of like body knowledge, body awareness, body intelligence. Yeah. How does that play into coaching? More specifically, you as a coach. Like how do you use your own body awareness as a coach? That's a great question, John. I think every coach needs to be practicing body awareness and mind awareness, all of these mindfulness pieces, because you cannot be a good space holder if you're like filled up with things that you're not aware of in your own experience, right? Like if you're sitting with a client and what's the loudest voice you're hearing is something internal saying, oh, I hope this session goes well. I hope I ask the right question. You know, I hope I can be present enough. Then you're not be present. And so embodiment, sitting for five minutes before my session with every single client, at least five minutes, and breathing and becoming aware of my body and becoming aware of my thoughts, that is like the most preparation I could ever do before a coaching call. And it makes me a better coach. It makes me more present. It makes me more of a space holder for that person. And I also call on my guides. I call on my future self. I call on my intuition to sit with me, to be with me. And I just set an intention, like, may I be the best space holder I can be? May I be present? May the client find this session as helpful as they possibly could. May they learn as much about themselves as they possibly could. Like I say, a little prayer. It's all part of my pre-coaching ritual. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> what, was your, what would your future self say right now? Like, um, yeah, yeah, what would she say? Yeah, she's really proud of me right now. And I think I've been calling on her more and more, bringing her into my sessions, bringing her into my business decisions. And I think she feels happy that I'm like calling on her and bringing her in. And I think she would say like, yes, you are doing, you are taking the steps to get to me. That's my goal. That's my wish. That's my intention. Mm -hmm. 
feel my coaching self want to ask coaching questions, but we'll let that be there for a little bit. I feel like sometimes when I'm co- like when I'm coaching someone, I feel like I listen not just with my ears, but like there's a solar dish. Like I'm al- like I'm almost listening with like the air. You know what I mean? Yes. Like air yes. is listening at the same time, and like it's uh, I don't know. I don't know how else to describe it. Yeah, that's mindfulness. Yeah. That's yeah. second level listening, active listening. To me, when I started studying coaching, I was like, oh, this is just mindfulness. Mindfulness is training your awareness. And what is a coach but an aware vessel who's trying to quiet the ego to hold space for that being to allow them to be the expert? Yeah, it feels like uh, in an odd way, like empty self. Like, um, mm. It's like uh, becoming, like, it's like using active imagination to become the other person and then seeing how yourself feels it, as the other person. Mm, uh, yes. Right? Is that yes. in this space? Yeah, it's yeah. like active empathy, mm-hmm. but still with those boundaries because the non-attachment is key. Like right. you, you don't want to take on your client's suffering you still need to stand strong in your boundaries, but also be creative and imaginative and like free enough to be able to enter their experience and use your intuition to channel like what's happening. Right. Yeah. That's well said. It's, it's almost like, uh, and I feel like there's an active perspective on the state of client suffering. There's an active perspective that both honors that and witnesses that and sees it and hears them and says, yes, I hear in this, I hear you. I see you. Yes, yes. And I also have an assumption that I'm holding space for you to be able to handle this and be awesome Mm -hmm. and be your best self. Like it's like both, you hold both at the same time. Yes, yes. It requires a lot of Mm -hmm. presence and a lot of like mental training. And I think- can be so supportive trust you have to trust, trust. In the process Ooh. trust in it uh what do you what in your coach journey what did you find you had to let go of in in developing to be the coach you want to be i mean i'm still working on it i'm still working on letting go of attachment to the outcome of the session like there are times where i'm like oh no like they're not going to get out of it what i was hoping they would get out of it or even like what their initial agenda was when then we go deeper below the surface and you know other things are coming out and you realize you've got like five minutes left. There can be this like panicky moment of like, oh no, I have to control and tighten. But when I can practice non-attachment and just realize I'm doing it and trust, trust the process, like trust the client, trust that whatever is happening and transpiring is to serve their awareness, which is the goal, the ultimate goal. So just what the more I can trust and relax and release, the better the session, the better space I can hold for the client. I think the better the client feels and I can see that in them. Right, yeah, I feel like there's a, a net, like a lot of people who are attracted to coaching are also, they wanna be helpers. Makes sense. Uh, and I think our society teaches us one of the ways to help best is to give advice, have answers. And it's so ingrained to, to have that part of ourselves. From a mindfulness perspective, uh, I'm so curious because it feels like there's such clarity. Where does that part of us come from? Like from a, like as a, when you look in, yeah, I'd love to hear you go there. And- yeah, we have to bring compassion to it because when we bring compassion to that fixer part of ourselves, like there's steps to compassion, right? You become aware of it first, you accept it, you kind of allow it. You're like, okay, this is here. And then you investigate it. What does it want? Like, what is its ultimate goal? I do a lot of this like parts work. So looking at the like fixer part, what does it want? And often it wants control. And why does it want control? And it's so masquerading as the helper. It's really, it's an ego part. And that's bad that's self-actualization like that's part of the human experience but we can sort of quiet it and get to know it and ask it what it wants and what it wants is often control and it wants to be seen maybe as a helper 
And it's a bit more concerned with seeing itself reflected back as like, oh, you were the one that helped me and we're the expert in mm-hmm. the thing. Right. Mm-hmm. And like uh, trusting the process, trusting the client, allowing that there to be space for the possibility that the client already has the answers. Yeah, this is at the crux of coaching. I mean, this is what makes coaching coaching. Like, yes. Just saying right now. Yes. Yeah, it's in that, it's in that realm. Uh, what was your favorite, favorite exercise or the most surprising exercise in, uh, in the wellness 1.0? Oh my gosh. Future self, future self blew my socks off and I use it in the first session. I have a 12 week deep dive program and it's the first thing that we do and my clients love it. And we build everything from there. We basically like reverse engineer how to get there using mindfulness and embodiment. And, and then my, my own future self has shown me the steps that I need to take. And when I call on her, she brings this guidance. I and mean, then she's really my intuition. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, there's so much research uh, on future self. Um, they call it like, fu- uh, what they, they like future tense temporal uh, interventions is like some of the stuff that comes out in the positive psychology. Uh, it's robust. And there is a strong link both to um, the, the frequency someone thinks of their future self and the identification of it. How much do they identify? Like, do you see the future self as separate, like a separate individual from you, or do you see it as yourself? But, you know, like, what's the continuity between that person and you? Um, it's, it's vast and robust, and it's exciting to see. Uh, a lot of what we do in the coaching program supported by studies and what, so anytime you bring in future self and can create a stronger connection, people make better decisions. They make healthier decisions and they feel happier uh, because there's hope and human beings are really wired for hope. Uh, I'm curious, cause I know you've done training beyond this. What, What's a nugget that you would love to share to the larger coach training community of an exercise or idea or something that you've learned in your, your journey? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a great practice that I use. I mean, so first of all, when I'm in a session with a client, I, I do all my sessions, video sessions, if I can, because I'm looking for body language. I'm looking for the breath. Like I'm looking for these subtle things. And I'm always looking for an opportunity to practice with them. So by now my clients know like if they're really tense and they're not breathing and and they're talking about something that's really hard, I'll be like, do you want to practice? And they have the option to be like, no, but if they say yes, we pause, we close the eyes, we breathe together, we get embodied, we drop in and we investigate like where in the body is this showing up? Can you get really curious about that experience? Like, how does it feel? And then can you ask it what it needs? It's- All right, let's do it. Let's do it. I'll be your client. You do it? Yep, I'm going to do it. I want to play. And for all of those yeah, watching, yeah. listening, I invite you to do the same. But if you're driving, you have to keep your eyes open. Mm-hmm. Great, 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 John. I'm so excited. So open-minded. Let's okay. Let's do it. So come to stillness. Soften the gaze or close the eyes. Feel your feet flat on the floor. Settling down into the body. Dropping the shoulders. Take a deep breath in. And sigh it out. Good, again, in. And sigh it out. One more time. In. Allowing the shoulders to drop down the back. Letting your breath return to normal. Feel your body in space. Become aware of its boundaries. 
if you can. Feel your connection to the earth, to the seat below you. Just arrive here in this moment. Bring to mind something in your experience that you're resisting. Something in your life lately that you feel shouldn't be this way. Allow it to flood your experience. Becoming totally aware with the body. Like, what did it feel like? What does it feel like to resist? What changes in your physiological experience? Where in your body do you feel it? And John, you can answer me out loud if you wish, but it's totally up to you. Cool. Because they're, they're coming. All these answers are, they are ripping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. I can't even, uh, so I had a bike ride this morning, uh, a couple buddies, and uh, on the, the uphill part was great. The downhill part, my glasses were foggy and I couldn't see really well. And it was hard for me to drop into my body. And so I've been feeling this like, Oh, I know there's another level for me to hit, but I can't hit it. And I just, it's like, oh, I want to get there. Uh, and it just felt like the rest of my ride was off because I couldn't drop into myself. And that was an interesting feeling. Mm. That was an interesting feeling. Is that what came to mind just now as you were practicing? That and the website. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was like a one-two. Yeah, it was like a, uh, I, didn't, I didn't feel like I was able to like roar, and at the same time, uh, there's some pretty technical stuff we gotta deal with today. Yeah, so where in your body does that come up? Let's let's focus on the website maybe, like where in the body? Uh, okay, website, where is it now? Uh, a kinetic uh, wiggle. It feels like there's a kinetic wiggle that wants to happen. Um, <laughs> kind of like, uh, Wanting to start a race, but then feeling like you're running in sand. Like it just feels like. Expecting hard ground, but running in sand. Yeah, that's what it feels like. Mm. So like more like the feet, hips, like just like, mm -hmm. yeah, kinetic motion. Yeah, yeah, good. Mm -hmm. So bring your awareness there feet, hips, legs, wherever it's flaring up. Really feel it, you can sit with it. Breathing. That's uncomfortable. It's yes. uh, surprisingly uncomfortable. Yeah. There's emotion here too, wow. Like it's, uh, yes. yeah, it's real. Mm. What does this part of you need? A hug. It just needs to like, the website just needs a hug. It needs to be acknowledged and appreciated. Like all of the effort, you know, not just, not the talk of, oh, why wasn't it this way before? Like what, you know, not not the the criticism. It needs it needs acknowledgement. Acknowledgement. A hug. 
So focusing on this part of the body, the hips, the feet. We have a visitor too. Oh, hey, bud. Hi. <laughs> like your first, uh, your first um, uh, entrance, huh? Are you a kitty cat? What are you? Oh. You want to say what you are right now? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to finish up this call, okay? And then, what do you want to do? Doggy. I knew it. Here's a doggy treat. Mm. Go for it. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Very good. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, just as he came to you needing something, you can give it to him. You can do that. I know, I needed a hug and I got one. You know? Whoa. Great. That's pretty intense. He goes, and there he goes. <laughs> Yeah, it needed a hug. It needed an acknowledgement of, of the work, you know. How do you hold space? Because that's a lot of space holding. I mean, seriously, Ellen, that is some major heavy lifting on the, from a, a coach to be able to hold space for that. How do you hold space for clients in, in that space? Yeah, I hold space for myself as I'm coaching. I, I bring a hand to the heart. That's one of my go-to self-compassion action is just hand to the heart. For other people, it's a hand to the belly, a hand to a place that's in pain. I always bring my hand to my heart and that's my source. That's the source of my self-compassion. I draw on it. I practice. I just practice with them, you know? When I say let's practice, I'm practicing too. And I'm trying to be aware of my own experience. And sometimes I can actually feel what they're feeling. Like, they'll tell me I had this sensation in my body and I'm like, oh, me too. I feel like I can channel it sometimes. Like the intuition can tap into theirs as well. It's really powerful. It sounds super woo woo and maybe it is, and there are all there are these things like you know it's still infancy stage and i know there are different studies that go both ways but the idea of mirror neurons yes. where if they're if um you know or epigenetics were this idea of the the emotional signals of parents imprint their little ones and uh it sets their emotional registers so like depending on the positivity that's instilled in them, that's like their firm, like that's where their thermostat is, yes. you know? Kind of yes. Thing. We need to co-regulate. There's this lie of uh, like individuality or like rugged, rugged individualism, especially in our culture that we have to do everything on our own and we have to do it perfectly. And it's total BS. It's <laughs> very harmful. It's very toxic actually need each other and it's amazing even through these zoom sessions i have with my clients i can feel the connection i can feel what they're feeling and it, it absolutely it's empathy it's mirror neurons it's it's being studied now it's so funny the things you can just know in your body are true and then when the science catches up it's like oh cool like that's good but i didn't really need it i can feel it and i can trust that what i feel is real. There's an interesting interplay happening between the practice of coaching and then the study of uh, positive psychology and you know neurobiology and what's what's happening. Where I feel like a lot of coaching is working really well because as a coach, we follow our clients, we create things that just make sense. And if you're following your client and trusting the process, you're going to stumble upon the thing that they most need. And then you have neuroscience and positive psychology looking at, well, co so what are best practices in coaching? How can we measure them and test them? And uh, you know, sometimes coaching takes the lead and sometimes you know, positive psychology and neurobiology say, hey, look, these things exist. 
use them in coaching. How much do you, or where do you see this field of mindfulness, coaching, positive psychology? Where do you see it evolving over the next couple of years? Like let's say five, 10 years. It's exploding. I mean, it's so exciting. The science that's coming out now, like it's thrilling. I watched a documentary. I think it was called my year of mindfulness. I highly recommend it. Watch it on YouTube. It's basically a journalist. I think she has lupus. She has a, like an autoimmune disease and she began this like experiment, like, okay, I'll practice mindfulness for a year. And she had never practiced meditation before. And so it follows her journey of a year and she's getting really comprehensive brain scans throughout the process. So there's like real hard science happening, tracking and measuring like her inflammation decreasing, what's actually happening in the mind. Um, it, it's fascinating. And it's not like a silver bullet, like, okay, you do this and it fixes everything. And I like how she, she provides like a lot of disclaimers and like, it just feels very honest, but you can also just see her journey, how, how her life is transformed through the process, especially with, she goes on a silent retreat and it mm -hmm. just, everything open for her and I actually entered this work through like my own like spiritual awakening studying Buddhism practicing Buddhism and then sort of like coaching just happened naturally um, so there is a really interesting emergence of like Buddhist psychology and like even like secular Buddhism um, and like what it does to the brain and how when we become aware of our thoughts we can hold space for them. And when we allow and we don't resist, the pain and the negativity and the suffering sort of dissolves. Like when you bring it to your mind, when you allow it into your awareness, it's not a problem anymore. It's only when you resist it that it becomes a problem. So it's a really common sense approach to life. Oh, that's so cool. That's super cool. Uh, on the, so, well, let's take some, let's see if there are some Q&A from the, the people who are listening. Um, sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. You can just roll with that. Uh, but on our, on the Coach Train EDU blog, we will, uh, how can people, well, there'll be links to your website, your things. What do you have cooking? What's, how can people uh, work with you? What would be, yeah. yeah, where can they find you? Please work with me. So my company is called Luminous Leanings. And I'm sure there will be an Instagram handle somewhere. Uh, but it's just at Luminous Meanings on Instagram and Facebook. My website is luminousmeanings.com. I have a few options. I've been doing a stay home sale during the pandemic um, for one hour individual sessions you can purchase. But you can also do my 12 week deep dive self care coaching program. It's called Become Your Own Soulmate. It's a really, really sweet program where I provide journal prompts, guided meditations, custom guided meditations throughout the 12 weeks. And then of course we're meeting every week as well. I also do a free self-love sermon every Tuesday at eight o'clock Eastern time, live on my Facebook and Instagram page. It's an interactive discussion and we're practicing meditation together. We're practicing embodiment together. It's really sweet. So yeah, those are some great ways to work with me and just check out my blog, check out my work. I hope it serves you. That's beautiful. Thank you, Ellen. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm sure there'll be more to come on, you know, in the coach training EDU world. Uh, but thank you. Thank you for this sharing. Thank you for, for jumping in and doing, you know, walking through that little bit. I'm impressed like that truly is a lot of space to hold as a coach mm -hmm. and uh this work I, I feel like it is the work that the world needs and they don't even like most people don't even know it it's like people being thirsty for water and not even having like had a drink at all uh so just thank you thank you thank you for the work you're doing the impact on the world wow thank uh, you john more to come Thank you so much. But then to the whole team, I mean, this program really set me up for success. So thank you guys so much. Thanks, Alan. And thanks to everyone joining us today. And for those listening on the podcast, thank you. We will see you next week.